Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erin, and I'm a junior at Hathaway Brown. On behalf of the entire City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum Council, I would like to welcome you to our forum on internet safety. Today, we have three distinguished guests, the Honorable Judge Brendan Sheehan, Officer George Lichman, and Mr. Bennett L. Gaines. Judge Sheehan is a judge at the Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court and has been on the bench since 2009. Before being elected judge, he did a large amount of work with internet safety, education, as well as being a county prosecutor. Officer Lichman is an honorable Rocky River police officer with 10 years of, field, er, of patrol work. Um, he is also an investigator for the Ohio Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. One of his many specialties is, in, is investigating computer crimes. Mr. Gaines is responsible for the delivery of IT services, including the development of corporate IT strategy and government governance process, as well as communications and data network at First Energy. As part of his job, he is responsible for the digital security of his company. So please welcome all three guests. Thank you. Uh, first of all, my name is Brennan Shin. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here in, in such a distinguished group of, of the future of tomorrow, individuals for the future of tomorrow. I'm sitting here talking at lunch with, with, with the officers of the uh, youth program, and I, I'm amazed and, and honored to, to be here and, and to be thought of to come back here and speak to you. Uh, prior to being a judge in Cuyahoga County, I was the director of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. This task force investigated uh, individuals who went online and tried to solicit, harm, and, and, and exploit individuals in our community. I became the national director at, at down in um, the Department of Justice formed a national Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, and I became the chairman of the legal committee and advised prosecutors, police officers, and students on the dangers of the internet. So I have a little PowerPoint. Myself and Mr. <coughs> Lichman are going to talk for the first 20 minutes. And then at the end, we'll be able to take questions. But I want to play this video first for you. on the national board when they came up with that video. And the message is clear. You may have seen that on TV. You may have seen it in commercials. But the point is we're trying to get to the people who post images online that once you post, you don't know who's looking at it. You don't know who's viewing it. Your friends may be looking at it, your family, your teachers, your neighbors, your employers. Uh, your colleges and universities that you may be applying to, even the police officers. Um, you know, I just had a case today where a young 17-year-old boy got in a car accident and he was angry at the individual who, hit him, who, who he hit. And he said, old people can't drive, they're too slow. He made a YouTube commercial um, and, and, and talking about that accident. Lo and behold, we're in trial today, and what do you think came up? His, you po his YouTube poster, his postings on this accident, and all those things that he said. You folks don't know what, when you put stuff online, the colleges, the universities you're applying for, uh, the, uh, your teachers, the police, they're all looking at that kind of stuff. So you should be aware of what you post online. And I, I think this is a very intelligent group. You know that once you put an image online, you don't think you can get it back, do you? It's out there forever. It can never be taken back. So you're at a friend's house, and you post an image, and you want to share it. You think it's funny at the time. Uh, lo and behold, it's out there on the internet, and it's out there forever. And at the time, it may have been funny. 
but now looking back at it, you wish you never posted it. Um, when you post online, always remember this. What is on the internet can be out there forever. It can be copied or changed. It can be traced by law enforcement. It could be illegal. You may think it's something that is not any big deal, but it could be, term it could be determined illegal. I'm going to uh, refer now to Mr. Lichman here on this exact posting. This is a family portrait that was posted online. George? The woman in this picture had this uh, portrait taken and used the image on her Christmas cards in 2008. She also has a web blog that she writes and a Facebook account, and she posted the image on each of those sites for her family and friends to see. Uh, several months later, a friend of hers was traveling in Czechoslovakia, of all places, and saw this advertisement uh, in a grocery store window. And that is her family, and she did not give any permission uh, for anyone to use that image. But since it was out there and online, someone took it without permission and used it, and she really has very little recourse. You know, um, an area that is hot in the news and, and, and is being talked about a lot is cyberbullying in your schools, in the neighborhoods, with your friends. And just for everyone's on the clear, uh, what is cyberbullying? It's any harassment using computers or electronic messaging. Um, and it is illegal to use computers, phones, digital services to cause annoyance and alarm. Um, I want to play this video for you. Okay, Lindsay, you're up. Today we're going to talk about Patty. Patty's best characteristics, she's stupid, stupid and ugly. Everything she does is ugly. Watch her eat, watch her stuff her face. Look at her, greasy hair, dirty fingernails. It makes me want to vomit. Her dad doesn't work, they have no money. That's why she wears that nasty pink sweater. Everyone hates her, even the teachers, and they're supposed to like everyone. Get a life, Patty. Thank you. If you wouldn't say it in person, you shouldn't type it. Delete cyberbullying, don't write it, and don't forward it to anyone. Just this morning, um, I'm getting ready to come down here, and on the Today Show was a story of a young girl who had a Facebook account copied. Uh, a fake Facebook was made up about her, about how she eats, what she looks like, and it was pretty mean stuff. She did her own research, and this is on the Today Show this morning. Did her own research and found out it was two of her friends thinking that it was funny. They're now being charged with a criminal offense based upon what they did on Facebook by creating a fake Facebook account, creating an image of her, and putting that out there for the public to see. Now, in Ohio, if you uh, have a cyberbullying case, you could be charged with these kind of crimes. Disorderly conduct, menacing, aggravated menacing, menacing by stalking, or telecommunication harassment. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a crime that, that you folks all need to know, and not just in this room, because everyone in this room I know wouldn't do this, but to spread it out to your friends, your family, your neighbors. So if this occurs in your presence or you hear about it, you can talk to him about it. Now I'm going to turn it over to George, and George is going to talk about something that's also pretty hot, a hot topic, and that's called sexting. Thank you. I'm sure everyone here has heard of uh, sexting and what it is. If you haven't, it's the act of sending inappropriate or sexually explicit photos electronically, typically via cell phone, but it can be any means. It's mostly young adults and teenagers who are engaged in this, in this activity, but it uh, really doesn't know any age limits. Um, a survey that it, which is real disturbing to us was taken almost two years ago of 1,200 uh, high school and middle school kids indicated that 20 percent of teenagers between 13 and 19 had sexually explicit or photos of themselves that contain nudity on their cell phones or their computers and that 11 percent of the children between 13 and 16 had those images of themselves on their cell phones or computers. 
Um, it can be very dangerous for people to do. 75% of teenagers and 71% of young adults say that engaging in this conduct has had serious negative consequences on their lives. And 24% of young women and 40% of young men said that they have had nude or semi-nude images meant for someone else shared with them. So that should give pause if you think of sending these images, there's a four out of 10 chance that it's gonna be seen by someone who you never intended to see it. 37% um, of young women and 47% of young men have reported that they've had sexually suggestive text messages and, e and emails meant for someone else shared with them. This kind of thing is not uh, unusual and as a police officer I deal with it on a very regular basis where uh, parents or students come to us and say these pictures are spread around the school and uh, spread online and they can do nothing to stop it. And this is uh, parallels very closely with what the judge was talking about in terms of posting images online. You can never get the images back. Sexting is dangerous for a lot of different reasons. Um, again, the images can, can spread very quickly amongst your peers and it causes a lot of emotional damage. The images can make it to illegal pornographic websites and there's very little that you or anyone else can do to, to get those images offline, particularly because a lot of these illegal pornographic websites are hosted outside the country and uh, even if we can identify the servers, it's very difficult for us to get the images back. Um, also images meant for one person can spread very quickly and be shared with everyone else. Um, a very quick anecdote, there was a terrible crime a few years ago in Cleveland. It resulted in a person's death and a Cleveland police officer using his camera phone took a picture of one of the victims of that crime and sent it to four or five or six of his policemen friends. Of course, he thought he could trust them, the blue line, all this other stuff, you know, their policemen, brothers and all this. Well, those few people who received the image sent it to a few police officers they thought they could trust. By the end of that day, Police officers I worked with in a totally different agency had the images on their cell phones. And two weeks later, I was giving an internet safety presentation at John Marshall High School in Cleveland. And I mentioned the story very generically. I didn't list the crime or, or what it was, just like I'm telling you. And students in that class knew exactly what I was talking about because they had images of this crime victim also. Um, you can see this is not a sexting story, but how quickly these images can spread despite thinking that you can 100% trust the people you're sending them to. Um, this is Jessie Logan. She lived in the Cincinnati area. When she was 17, she sent a picture of herself topless to her boyfriend, and that young man forwarded it to people, and they forwarded it to, to a few other people. And just like the story in Cleveland I told you about, before the, you know, before the end of a couple days, her entire school had the image of this young lady without her clothes on. She was harassed at school and her grades suffered. She ended up graduating and went off to college and the harassment continued. Enough people at college were familiar with the incident that they continued the harassment. And uh, Jessie committed suicide um, when she came home to attend the funeral of another student. Uh, and she went home and hung herself in her closet for her mom to find. Um, this is not a, an isolated incident in the city of Mentor. Over the past several years, we've had uh, three teenage suicides as a result of cyberbullying and internet problems. If the fact that this is harmful to yourselves and to other people is not enough to prevent you from uh, sending sexting messages, then you have to know that it is extremely illegal. Um, we could go over every one of these laws, but instead it's easier for me just to tell you that it's illegal to take a picture of yourself. It's illegal to possess the picture of yourself even on your own phone or computer. It's illegal to send it electronically to anyone. It's illegal to display the image to anyone else, even if it's not sent electronically. So if you just stand in front of a mirror and take a picture of yourself without your clothes on, you've committed two crimes. You took the picture and you possessed the picture. As soon as you send it to another person, you've committed a third crime by sending it electronically. And as soon as they open it, you've committed a fourth crime by displaying matter harmful to juveniles. Every one of these crimes is very serious. Every one is a felony and every one of them requires sexual offender registration for a minimum of 10 years, regardless of whether or not you're a juvenile when you commit the offense. This is a, a, a common thread that I've seen both when I was a prosecutor handling these cases and as a judge now that I see. And uh, you think it's harmless taking your own, a photo of yourself or your friends taking a photo of you 
and, and then all of a sudden it's in the shower or you're joking with a friend in the locker room and it gets sent out. Um, they think that it's, it's a joke, it's kind of funny, but in the end, they're standing in front of me as a judge looking at these crimes that they're charged with and a registration that, that's with them for the rest of their lives. So it's a serious crime, it's a serious offense, and uh, you gotta be aware of that if in fact you know. I mean, with today's technology, everybody has a cell phone in this room, I know. And every single one of you have a camera phone on that phone. Um, so be aware of this. But it hurts people. It hurts people very much. Here are some resources for you guys if you're interested. OhioICAC.org is probably the best website because there are links to other uh, information on those uh, sites. And if you have any questions or need further information, you can contact um, the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, Judge Sheehan, or me right here. And that's all. With that, we're going to go to our third speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I think the judge and the officer have done a very good job of outlining what I think you all, and, and how many of you in here have an email address? So by show of hands, it looks like everybody. Um, the other thing is, how many of you think that email address is just yours? Well, you're kidding yourself. It's not yours. And the second part of that is, how many of you have a Facebook or a Twitter account? Well, I just show a hand, there looks to be probably 200 people in this room. Guess what? There are 50 million people that are on Facebook. Everybody has access to you. Everybody on Facebook or Twitter has access to you. Now, the judge and the officer showed you different ways that people can get access tagging your picture, looking at your post, seeing you through one of your friends, chaining you so that you connect to a group. There are multiple ways, while you think there are privacy settings that you can put in place, you have the opportunity. They've done a very good job of outlining what I think um, are some of the issues, and I think they've provided you some very good resources to look at. Now let's talk about this. Uh, I've been in uh, the IT world for now 25 years. Um, so I kind of grew up with the personal computer. And you think about a personal computer, 25 years ago it sat on a desk, it did Excel, it did Word, uh, but it didn't communicate very well with each other. You think about a personal computer today, the same personal computer that I had 25 years ago is sitting in my hand. It's actually more powerful than my hand. And the reason it's more powerful is for what reason? Because in this, I can connect to the world. This device connects me anywhere in the world. And once that happens, I lose control of that. Now let's talk about what that means in the work world. I do probably, uh, on average, if you look at the amount of traffic, email traffic that goes in and out of our company, somewhere between two to four million emails a day. Think about that. Two to, that's, those are just emails. Now, how many of those do you think are good emails versus bad emails? Interestingly enough, 99% of emails are bad emails. Think about your email account that you have. I'd venture to say that you sort through a lot of spam, some phishing, some probably uh, inappropriate materials. Well, guess what? Somebody's out there looking for you. They're looking for that opportunity. And the first time that you bite on that opportunity is when you're exposed. Now let's talk about that, what that means. Innocently, you could find yourself exposed. Four years ago, we hired somebody into the company. And interestingly enough, through the application process, you have to disclose certain things about your past, and that goes into a background check. And that background check actually is looked at both for criminal, and now it's even starting to be looked at for behavioral reasons. Things that you did that might have a negative influence about you as an employee of the company. Interestingly enough, the employee, I'm clean, I've never done anything. Uh, it turns out that they were part of a pornographic ring and sending pornography. And it was through the chains that we were able to connect 
not in his current email account, but in his previous email accounts, which he had turned off, that we were able to unveil the fact that he was involved in something that was not only inappropriate but illegal. Now think about that. You know, you're all sitting here and you're, I, you know, I'm guessing the ages range from uh, looks like 12 to 20, maybe 25 of those that are still in school. I'm just guessing, okay? And I guarantee you, I know I've had probably 10, I, I've lost track of how many email addresses I've had. I've literally lost track. I would suggest to you, if you think you can bury your email, you think you can bury your past, you can't. And that's part of the message that the judge says. If you can't say it in front of somebody, if you don't follow the one principle, remember this word, the sunshine rule. And what the sunshine rule is very simple. Take the lid off the roof, take the, the top off of the building, and the sun shines in on you, and when people see what you're doing, would you still do the same thing? And if you answer that question, and you answer it, yes, I would, then what you've done is created a real, I think, risk or negative situation for yourself. And it's that one moment that you have to think about. It sounds like fun. It sounds like it's harmless. It seems like it's not going to affect me five years from now because I was just 16 years old. Well, or it sounds like, you know, um, that it was just my friend I sent it to, and I know that, you know, they took it as, as a joke. Well, 50 million people on Facebook, all of them aren't honest, all of them aren't your friends, and more importantly, I would assure you that there are some people out there every single day, two to four million emails a day, 99% of them are bad, okay? Of some of those, there's somebody out there looking to do harm, and I would suggest to you, as you think about the sunshine rule, and you're getting ready to click, hit the button, you're getting ready to take the photo, think about not that moment. Think about taking the roof off the house and somebody looking down upon you. And that somebody doesn't have to be your parent, that somebody doesn't have to be one of the officers. It could be somebody five years from now who chooses to do a background check on you and uncovers that in that moment that you thought it was fun or you thought it was going to be harmless, you now lost your job. And to that point, if you think about this young man, college educated, um, really, I think, had, had, had a phenomenal future into their career, uh, at least with the employer, their career is destroyed. Destroyed. Destroyed to the point where they lose their job. It's not to suggest they can't go out, but what they now have to do the next time they have a background check, it's going to be disclosed. It's going to be obvious that they, that is a part of their background. Now, I'll end it with this. I have a Facebook account, okay? I have a Twitter account. But you know what I do every day? I befriend as many people as I friend. I go look at my Facebook. Now, it doesn't say I look at it every minute, but I go check it. I look to see who looked at my wall. I go look at the postings on my wall. I really try to, the word friend, Okay, make sure that the people at least that I know are going to get it are, are, are what I think of people I would be friends with if I were sitting across the table. So it's not a bad thing. It has to be something that you have to manage and you have to be very conscious of. And if there's something that is wrong, you can correct it. You can, but don't ignore the things that are out there. You see a friend that went to a party and the pictures looked really fun and they were drinking and doing all kinds of things. Guess what? That's part of your chain. And if you don't befriend that person, if you don't correct that person, report that person sending, you're just as guilty. You're just as guilty. So with that, I'll end because I think what I'd like to end on is a positive note. I know all of you aren't going to go disconnect your Facebooks. I know all of you aren't going to do what we suggest. Think about the sunshine rule. Think about five years from now when somebody takes the roof off of what you just sent and or you just did, are you still willing to do the same thing? And I would suggest to you, you might think about that today. That's what I'm asking you to do. Think about what you do going forward. There are some things you absolutely can't correct. You know, if I can add one comment to that, great, great, great advice. And that is this, is uh, 
a lot of a lot of us forget when we're on the internet what we're putting out there. And I, I like to give a simple analogy. Would you walk over to Tower City today, and a lot of you have your name tags on, with your name tag on it, saying, hey, I live in, in, in Westlake, or Mentor, or Elyria, and your address, I like basketball, and my mom and dad aren't gonna be home till six o'clock. Would you walk around Tower City with that on your, on your lapel of your jacket or your, your, your coat? Why put that on the, on the internet? It goes back to what is out there. Be smart about what you post. We're saying these are great tools, great, great way to, to be connected, but be aware of the, 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 what you're doing so it doesn't come back and haunt you. That, I, I think we're now gonna post it for questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Kayla and I'm a junior at Laurel School. Today at the City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum, we are listening to the Honorable Brennan J. Sheehan, George Lichman, and Bennett L. Gaines. We will return to our distinguished speakers in just a few moments. But first, we encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now while we break for a few announcements. We welcome you to this City Club Youth Forum, part of the traditional City Club, which began in 1912. It is the oldest continuous running free speech forum in the country. Today's City Club Youth Forum is made possible through grants from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation, the Bruning Foundation, the Stocker Foundation, the William Weiss Foundation, and the Thomas White Foundation. We would like to thank our funders for their generous support. The City Club Youth Forum series is planned by a council of students from several area high schools. I would like to thank the members of the council whose names are in the program. Also, please note that there are surveys and pencils on your table. Please begin filling these out and we will collect them when you leave. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional question and answers. To ask a question, it must be, and it must be questions only, please raise your hand. As a courtesy, please stand, state your name in school, and hold your applause until the end of the program. Our microphone holders are Brianna Gilliam, Gilliam from Washington Park and Leslie Welliner from, of Hathaway Brown. Thank you. Okay, um, well, my name is Leslie Welliner, and my question is um, about the privacy settings on Facebook. So if our like, information is ex still accessible, like, what do the privacy settings on Facebook actually do? I'll take a stab at it and I think we'll probably collectively give you the right answer. It protects you against Facebook. It doesn't protect you against others. Uh, think about uh, 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 the, the technology that exists today uh, where you can go in to and take uh, an image on a screen and go to Photoshop and then take that Photoshop image and then replicate it and it looks, it mirrors the di digital image that sits on Facebook. There's a good example. So it does protect you against Facebook, but it doesn't protect you against others. And it's, the, it's how clever those people that are looking for things about you that are out there. There are so many other tools out there that bad people use in your innocence. And they're fairly easy. You can go buy Photoshop for, I think, 120 bucks. And it, it literally replicates that and creates a di digital image of it now. There, so there's just a good example. Would you I, like to add to that, please? Yeah, I think there's two things. First of all, if the Defense Department can get hacked, and if Google can get hacked, then Facebook can be hacked also. That's very easy to do uh, by someone with very minimal skills. The second thing and the more important thing, the more useful thing for all of you, just very quickly with a show of hands, who has more than 300 Facebook friends? Who has more than 500? Who has more than 800? How private is that? Okay, that's not private. You don't know those 800 people well enough to be sharing everything that you have on your Facebook account with them. In addition to that, any of those 800 people can copy and forward anything that you have on Facebook. And finally, any one of those 800 people can let anyone else have access to their account. 
So when you think of your privacy settings and you have it set to friends only, that's a nice start. But when you have three, five, eight hundred, or a thousand or more friends, you have to ask how private that really is. I was told Aaron Mann has uh, 5,000. Aaron. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Ariel Clark, and I go to Washington Park. And I wanted to know if you guys personally knew anybody that went through like getting a business put out on the internet. A business put up? Like, like getting like their personal, like getting exposed on the internet oh. or bullied, cyber bullied or something. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I handled as a uh, prosecutor uh, a lot of cases in which um, a, a young girl, I'll just give a, I'll, I'll give a, uh, goes back to security, thought her best friend uh, would, would be uh, able to share her password to her email account. Her best friend and her got in a fight. And all of a sudden, her best friend then took over her email account because she gave away her password. Next thing you know, there's an email to a boy in that school that she liked that embarrassed her, it, it humiliated her, and not only that, there is a Photoshop of a photo of her that was sent in that email uh, doing not pleasant things. Uh, this girl was so embarrassed, so hurt, uh, she didn't want to go back to school. Uh, her parents actually had to transfer her out of that school to another school district because of how hurtful that, that, that hacking of, a, of an image. On that note, I will spread this to everyone. No one, not your brothers, not your sisters, not your best friend should know any of your passwords on any of your emails or, or Facebook accounts. Um, there is a simple example of what happened and how did I get involved? Well, her parents were so upset about the images that were sent out that actually the young, uh, the people who hacked in and, and created those images were, were prosecuted in juvenile court as a result of that. So that's an example. I'll pose it back to you. Well, the same thing. Um, not from a legal standpoint, but from an employment standpoint. Um, very sensitive to uh, the types of things that are in emails. Um, you know, it's easy to say something in an email. It's real easy to be um, real aggressive with somebody. Um, or in some cases be real negative to somebody. And so we monitor every single email of every employee. Now, we don't look at it, but we let employees know that on any given day, we can go look into your email account. And in, in doing so, if there's something in there, then it can become a disciplinary an issue with that employee. And so, you know, it, it, it's back to, again, I, I would ask this just and I'll close with this. All of you have Facebook. How many of your parents are your friends? Not all of you, though. Not all of you. Think about that. Think, why wouldn't you want your parents or your uncle or whoever, somebody that's in your household, to be your friend? Okay. Just think about that. Those are the kind of things I ask you all to think about. If, if your parents can't be your friends, then who can be your friends in? Those are the kind of tests that you should be thinking about as you're sending this information back and forth. Okay. There's a question back there. Oh, okay. oh I can't. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Corey Banks from Elyria High School. <clears throat> My question is, what's the difference between somebody chewing me out or disrespecting me in person or doing it on the internet? Well, depending on how they do it on the internet, if they do it in person, the only person who hears it or sees it is you and whoever else is in the room. And depending how it's done online, if they do it, say for example on Facebook and you have 500 Facebook friends, then the 500 people that are your friends who read your wall and your posts will see it. In addition, 
if they do it online via email or text message, those emails or text messages can be forwarded to as many people as one of the recipient chooses. So one way is personal between you and the other individual and maybe whoever else is in the room. And the second option online, it's recorded and forwarded and visible for hundreds and thousands and potentially millions of people to see and read. Um, my name is Nicole. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh. My name is Nicole. John Hay, and like when I grow up, I want to become a lawyer or something into that type of category. But like, in order for me to like get that job, maybe or something, like, can they go back and look at like all my cell phones and everything that I did? Can they look at that or? You know, uh, I could tell you this: uh, the competition to get into college, as all of you know is so, so high. College uh, applicants are, are looking at Facebook. The colleges are looking at your Facebook uh, and your, your, your MySpace and your LinkedIn and different accounts that you have. Law schools look that same process, your background. Your, 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 is this the kind of person that we want in the legal community? The law school does that. But then let's take it one step further. Before you become a lawyer, you have to get um, interviewed by members of the bar to see are you qualified ethically and morally to be a lawyer in this community. And the people who do those background checks go on Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, all the different categories. You know, do yourself a favor tonight. Go home and Google yourself. Go to Google and Google your name and look up everything that comes up. And then do an image. Hit on image uh, of yourself on Google. And then say, OK, what do I have to do now? And, and that would be a great, great opportunity for you to realize everything you put out there is out there forever. Go ahead. I, I would add to that. Um, there. There, there are two windows that even the government looks at. Most government records are kept for seven years. Most, not all. Some, some are three, but most federal records are kept for seven years. Most email accounts in your large, your Yahoo's, your Gmail's, uh, they keep a record of that image a minimum of three years. Minimum, okay, sometimes longer. Most cell phones, uh, most cell phone companies uh, will retain an entire history of your life account with a cell phone. Most, not all, will retain the entire life. So you could have changed cell phone numbers, but your account is what actually gets you there. So your account is not the phone number. Guess what it is? Your social security number. That is, your, that is a part of your digital image, is your social security number. And so the answer to your question is, uh, it's, I would like to give you a black and white answer, but I'll give you a, 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 a real clear answer, yes. OK. Um, Black and white mean, well, maybe not, or maybe. It is, yes, you are exposed to, good or bad, your past. And, and companies, uh, depending on what the position is, what the role is, uh, will look as far and hard as they need to to convince themselves that you are a person of integrity uh, and that there's nothing that might jeopardize uh, your future employment with them. And you could get hired, as I described to you this person. They were hired, they were in the company four years working, had seen promotions, had seen raises, very responsible person, and in their minds, all that was the past. Well, it's, it's not, depending on how you answered the questions in the background. Our, our society and our economy even is becoming information-based these days. It's not industrial, it's, it's not less and less service-oriented, it's becoming information-based. and. Uh, the more information a company or a search engine or anyone else has, the more powerful that company can be and the more profitable that company can be. Um, things are stored online. If they don't save the information, then what's the point of, of collecting it? Um, in addition to that, I've done background investigations for the police department, mostly for new hire police officer candidates. And the city spends money on databases and search engines that we can have access to. Mr. Gaines, I'm sure, knows all about some of those. Um, and the first place I went to look was the resources that are free online, Google, White Pages, uh, any other search engine. Uh, 
what used to be accessible only th uh, through paid services is now becoming accessible to anyone in this room. It's just easier and easier to do. Hi. Um, Cody from Sanford High School. My question is mostly directed to uh, Mr. Gaines. I was just wondering that when you're looking at application for hiring, how often do you look at their Facebook? And is that an integral part in the making your decision to hire them or not? 100%. 100%. 100%. <laughs> Easy. Easy answer. You know why, though? Here's, here's the two reasons why. Guess what we do now? We don't take paper-based applications. We take electronic applications. So guess what? We have your email. That's the first thing. Second thing is, is that um, in, the, in the process now, good or bad, it's a lot of ways that people communicate. They communicate through Facebook. So we'll go back to what I think all three of us saying. I don't suspect that any of you are going to probably go home and disconnect your Facebook uh, accounts today. I, you may be a few of you, okay? So what we're saying is use it intelligently. Think about what you do. Think about what you do going forward. This meeting isn't maybe to say, oh my gosh, I've got something out there. You know, those are things you have to, the reality of what you have to do with. But you can control what you do going forward. You know, as I saw uh, Cody stand up, he's wearing a sweatshirt that said uh, St. Edward High School uh, State Champs in Football. I went to St. Ed's. But I want you to know something very clear there. When you're taking photos of yourself on Facebook, and we're talking about yourself individually, think about the organizations, the schools that you belong to, and you put something up there that has your school name on it, how that affects your school too. So that's another thought process that, that should go into that when you think about posting stuff, how it would reflect on your school too. Mr. Gaines some, said something I think is important. You know, you guys are not expected to go home and, and try to eliminate yourselves online. In fact, to eliminate yourself online might be more hurtful to you than helpful because the internet is here. It's not going anywhere. It's the way that you're going to apply for college, apply for jobs. You're going to do all your banking online. You're going to, your lives are going to depend on the internet. I love the internet. I've loved it since the first time I got online. I've had email. Uh, you know, since the first email account I could get in the mid-90s. Um, I have Facebook, I used to have a MySpace, Twitter, all of it, I love it. But you just need to think about what you're doing and what you're putting he, He's so old internet. he knows what floppy disks actually look like. <laughs> <laughs> and probably there, some. there wasn't even a floppy <laughs> disk. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so you're aging us there. Here, look. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, really I'm Zach Cook from O'Leary High School, and I'm asking if you think getting bullied cyberly is worse than getting bullied in person. From a one-on-one -on -one perspective, uh, at the initial bullying, I don't know that it's worse, but the reason that it's so much more dangerous cyberbullying as opposed to real-life bullying is because of the volume of people who can witness the bullying, the same as the other Illyria High School young man asked about, you know, if you wouldn't, if you'd say it in person, why not say it online? Again, it's because there could be 800 or 1,000 or more people who witnessed that bullying. So when you come to school the next day or, or um, amongst your peers the next time, when you've been bullied electronically, every one of those people or many, many more people We'll, we'll know about that experience and whatever it was you were picked on about. And we'll, you know, either uh, feed off of it or share it with other people or even just mention it to you, causing you some distress. Well, some, something also that rings a bell. Emails can be interpreted so many different ways or statements can be typed out statement. Compared to in person, some things may have been said in jest and you know by the way the, way the person said it. On an email, it could be taken, or in writing, it could be taken so many different ways. And, uh, you know, and I, I'd, have to, I'd have to tell everyone that. Um, if you think about it, if you have a problem with someone, talk to that person face to face. Don't put it out there for the world to see it. I'm Joshua with Lincoln West, and I want to know within the past several years, how many minors have been prosecuted for tax related crimes, and what is the sentence range? Good question. I can tell you, uh, when I was a prosecutor, the prosecutor's office 
um, had charged individuals, but there's something called diversion. And, and they were not given a criminal felony sentence. They were, they were given something where they had to do community service and go out there and, and, and try to re, uh, give back to society based on their actions on there. Um, child pornography, um, those people sought help. Those people who are looking at images of, of young children being abused and sexually molested, those images are, are serious. And, and all of you should know child pornography is, is a dangerous, dangerous subject matter. And the prosecutor's office in this county and in the, in the country, all the prosecutor's offices are taking that crime very serious. And you read in the newspaper, people had possessed images of children. Um, the prosecutor's office has, has vigorously prosecuted those cases. And those cases go to ju the, the juveniles that have been prosecuted. I couldn't tell you a number. But I, I could tell you those cases were prosecuted and uh, sentences were given. And can you imagine going on with the rest of your life with a, with a registration requirement that's required by law? and that make you register for the rest of your life that you've been convicted of this kind of offense. And that's what the laws are. So um, it's a very, very uh, serious thing. And, and, I, and I just want to, uh, the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, which is in Alexandria, Virginia, is the um, group that has really advocated it. And there's a case that I prosecuted that a young girl actually was taking photos being harmed by, her, by an adult. And um, I still get a call from that young girl now in college asking me, Mr. Sheehan, how many times has my image of that horrible event been viewed and seen and people prosecuted? And think about that chilling call. It's once a year I get that call. And she's always concerned about that image being out there. So that's why they take that. It, it, it's not, it's a horrible event for that person, but imagine it being created on an image in a video or on a picture that's being sent out across the world, not just in the United States, but across the world. And um, that's why that crime is prosecuted the way it is in, in dealing with the child pornography issue. Okay. Um, hey, my name is Thurman King from Max Hayes High School. Um, I, have a, um, I want to change the topic a little bit. Um, say you were on a chat room with a friend, and instead of putting pictures of someone else, they decided to put someone else's information, like their address and their number and where they work. Like, is this illegal too? Can they be charged for this act? It depends on the context. Uh how they're presenting that information. Sometimes perhaps they could be and sometimes perhaps they could not. There's not a, a simple explanation for that. However, um, the judge mentioned just today on the Today, just today on the Today Show, uh, there was a group of people who did exactly that. They kind of created a false Facebook account about a young woman and they are being charged criminally. So under certain circumstances, yes, you can be charged criminally for that type of behavior. I think in that, in that crime, they were charged with stealing the identity of another. It was the crime. Yes. Hi, I'm Rayshawn from Lear High School. Um, my question was, can you be prosecuted for sexting if you're on the receiving end and you never requested that to be sent to you? <laughs> and, yeah, can you be prosecuted? You, sure. you can be charged with possessing the image. If the image is on your device and it's been sent to you, you possess it and you can be charged with possession of the image. My advice to anyone who gets those images, uh, you know, first of all, don't send it to anyone else because we'll be able to see when there's a forensic examination done of your phone or your computer, we'll be able to see that that, images was, that image was sent from your phone and how many times and to how many people uh, and, and to whom you sent it. That's the first thing. When we find that on your phone and you say, oh, well, somebody sent this to me and I never did anything with it, we'll know whether that's true or not. Uh, the second thing I would say is to delete it right away. Um, but I think in a perfect world, what you should do would be to not send that image, take the device to your parents or a, a teacher or trusted adult and discuss bringing that image to law enforcement because someone 
potentially is having their image spread around in an illegal way and can cause harm to another person. And that person may really appreciate that you bring that to the attention of someone who can attempt to put a stop to it or hold accountable whoever was uh, engaging in that kind of behavior. Uh, my name my, my name is Kevin. I'm from John Hay. Uh, I wanted to know what made uh, the three of y'all want to be with y'all, be with y'all are today, and where y'all get y'all GD or oh, degree? I'm sorry, say that again. We didn't hear that. The last, last, part? last part of it. I got the first part. Oh. Where'd you get your degrees? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I'll start over um, here and we'll go this way. Okay. Let's see. Uh, where, I, where I started, I've always been in the IT world. I worked for IBM for a very long time. Uh, I have uh, technical training and, and, and degrees. Uh, so my interest was always uh, in technology. And as I said, it was really at the beginnings of, of what today is the personal computer. In fact, uh, in 1981, I had the pleasure of working on the team with an IBM that worked on the first personal computer. Uh, my uh, degrees uh, are in business, uh, and I have an MBA, uh, and a, uh, what brought me to my job now, which I've been in five years, uh, is my interest in leading a large organization uh, that uh, is focused on providing IT or technology solutions for a company. I have about 600 people. Uh, in my IT organization that do programming, development, support, network, uh, both at the uh, internet level and also in the entire business area. I uh, graduated from Elyria High School, so I'd like to say that I'm so happy to see <laughs> so many people here from Elyria High not only attending but being very participative in the, in the forum today. I'm very happy to see that. And then I attended Eastern Michigan University and got a bachelor's degree in public law and government. Honestly, I kind of chickened out of going to law school and wish I had done that um, 15 years ago, but uh, decided to get into police work instead. There was a case that I worked on in um, probably 2004 or five. One of, it was one of, the, uh, one of the worst pedophile cases that, that well, the worst that I was personally involved in, but one of the worst that I had even ever heard of, and that's where I met Judge Shee, and he was a prosecutor. And as a result of, of that case, became involved in the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force um, to continue to work to prevent children from being victimized the way the young man that we dealt with and several others, it turned out, were victimized. I uh, went to St. Ed's High School, then went to Baldwin Wallace College here locally, and I went to Cleveland Marshall College of Law. After law school, I clerked for a federal judge, um, and I was involved in federal court for four years. Um, I went to a civil firm. I worked for a firm for about a year and a half, but I always wanted to try cases and be in front of a jury. I went to the prosecutor's office. I became a prosecutor. I was a prosecutor for 11 years. Um, I was in the major trial unit, which handled all the rapes and murders in the city of Cleveland. Uh, I was in, in the county, excuse me, not just the city of Cleveland, the Cuyahoga County. Um, I, after serving as a lawyer for over 13 years, I decided that it was time to run for judge. And um, I ran for judge, and uh, I was, it was an open spot. Each judge is elected in Cuyahoga County for a period of six years and then you run for re-election. And I'm in the second year of my six-year term, and I can't tell you the satisfaction I get as a judge in trying to give people help, both the victim and the defendants, and, and seeing justice is done in our courts and our system. And I invite every single one of you here in this room, if you ever want to come down to the courthouse, visit the courthouse, view what the courtroom's all about, please look me up, and I'd gladly give you that tour. Uh, hi, I'm Sam, and I'm from the Lincoln West. Uh, several websites like uh, Facebook and YouTube have been created. Uh, what do you think about that? Are they a legal business, and whom you want to blame on that? Um, they're excellent business tools yeah. to uh, do what I suggest 
uh, you are doing, and that's reach people that you would not normally have the opportunity to make connections with. Uh, no different than in, uh, with you, though, there are things businesses do to protect themselves. Uh, an example of what we do uh, in our company is we don't connect Facebook to our corporate network. It, it's a standalone, so that we don't have any risk of somebody sending something in that's got a virus, that may be, again, negative information, and having it connect to our network. Um, and so it, it's just those little things that we're conscious of, but as a business tool, uh, it's reaching many in a very simple and easy way. Can I, can I do something, and I'll show you one of the most powerful ways that I think all of you can network. Let me, let me show you something. <laughs> Judge Sheehan, you and I are graduates of the same alma, alma mater, Baldwin Wallace College. A pleasure. Pleasure Good meeting. To see you. Pleasure another, meeting. You. Another yellow jacket in the room. <laughs> the point being is, it's a person. You it, think about the sincerity of that. Yeah. It's me learning something about him as I'm listening to him, who I didn't know before. Didn't realize that he was a BW grad, and I now have a relationship and an identity with him. Again, I would suggest that your 500, 800 friends on Facebook aren't that sincere. They don't have your interest in mind and probably don't even have a lot in common because you can put anything you want on Facebook. But I think there's an opportunity now where I have a relationship, I have something in common, and I suggest to you that the hour that I've spent on this stage will be much more valuable than me befriending somebody or friending somebody on Facebook. So just some advice. Um, hi, my name is Jerry Williams. I'm from Elyria High School. Um, I got two questions. I want to know if has someone ever been in trouble for uh, like sending images or anything, but like it wasn't them. Like someone hacked into their computer and was sending images out. And if they did, did you guys um, investigate to see if it was them or not? I'll, you know, I I could tell you from my standpoint, um, there's always. A, a tag that comes from a, you know, you say that this image came from this computer at this time. The, the real issue then becomes who was behind that computer at that time. And um, one of the things that we, I used to look at when I was in that position was the time it was sent and I'd look at where that individual was when it was sent. And I was always able to match that up. There was times where I said, I didn't do it, I, I was at school that day. And no one else was home in that house. And we go to the school record, and lo and behold, uh, there it is. Uh, the individual was uh, not at school, but so, or I'm sorry, was at school. And sure enough, someone else was at the house on that person's account. So we're able to look that up by the timestamp. So before anyone is ever in, 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 in prosecuted for these kind of crimes, there's always an investigation to look at was this a, uh, an individual who was there? Could it be shown that he was behind on that computer or he, she behind that computer at the time that message was sent or that image was sent? So we do those investigations. Um, I should say we. I'm talking like I was. I, I don't do those investigations anymore, but they do those kind of investigations. And they look at that, or they should be. And I'll put that back to George. It's, you know, if someone hacks into your account, like you mentioned specifically, uh, when we do a forensic exam of your computer, we'll see that that computer was not online at the time that the image was sent. And so we'll know that it didn't come from that machine. Well, like, I think the judge answered that pretty well about how we, we do have to put a, an individual at the keyboard of the computer. And if, if uh, there's evidence that you were not the individual behind that computer, then we wouldn't be able to charge you personally with that. Thank you to our distinguished speakers, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned. Before you go, we would like to ask you to fill out the surveys and we'll collect them at the door.